our first speaker is Konstantin Anakin that will present the paper uh, The World the Cognitively Informed Models of Memory Storage, Retrieval and Processing in Nervous System. Konstantin Anakin yeah. 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 is co-chart of MDIC Center and PK Anakin Institute of Normal Physiology in Moscow. Thank you. <laughs> this is indeed the title and topic which I was planning to talk about. I was going to tell a simple uh, thing that from uh, it's my ex own experience in studies of the neural mechanisms of memory, which I do for 25 years. Uh, there is an interesting pattern emerging. We start from neurobiological models and there is how memory is stored and go deeper into the cellular and molecular mechanisms. Neuromodeling also starts from neurobiological theories of how memory circuits are organized. However, in our own experience, we repeatedly face the same situation that whenever we go deeper into the particular neurobiological theories and start to explore them experimentally, we come with the new surprising and unexpected results and findings which break these theories and force us to modify these neurobiological models. However, when we go back into the history, we find that these hypotheses, which are resulting from the recent neurobiological data, are present in cognitive psychology. And we would have been much wiser if we would have paid attention to these hypotheses which could guide our research years before we did them. So I was going to tell that in modeling, we should also pay attention uh, to these cognitive models of memory, though they might be not yet represented in neurobiological theories and levels. But from yesterday experience, after uh, yesterday's <coughs> keynote, uh, speaker. I decided that I should modify my talk. I will come back uh, at the end of the talk to this topic, but I thought that it would be uh, probably useful and interesting to start it with some introduction on cognitive neuroscience research in Russia, because many of the things which were discussed yesterday resemble uh, the research facts and theories which uh, were developed in Russian cognitive neuroscience years before. So what I will do, I will speak briefly about historical traditions for studies of neurobiology of mind and consciousness in Russia. Uh, I will say a few words about how the current research uh, is organized uh, in cognitive neuroscience in Russia, how uh, it is funded, what are the projects, and we'll then uh, say something about scientific schools, which is quite a unique feature uh, at the present time of uh, organization of science in Russia. Cognitive neuroscience, a term which is so popular now, has been a long-standing tradition uh, in Russian research. And if you'll go to the uh, historical accounts of the development of brain and mind uh, research, uh, you might find a number of the names uh, from Russian physiology. One of them was Ivan Mikhailovich Sechenov. In uh, 1863, he wrote uh, a book which was called An Attempt to Introduce Physiological Foundations into Mental Processes. The title was banned uh, by the censor as too revolutionary 
and this uh, book is known more as Reflexes of the Brain. Uh, he argued uh, in discussion with the psychologists and philosophers, and this is reflected in uh, his uh, paper of 1873, that uh, psychology should be developed by uh, people who have an uh, experimental basis in physiology. And one of uh, his most interesting uh, papers is paper on elements of thought, where he develops a physiological theory for development of third categorization, uh, concept formation on physiological basis. Ivan Petrovich Polov was inspired by a session of uh, reflexes of the brain and after receiving a Nobel Prize uh, in Physiology of Digestion he turned to studies of the what he called molecules of the mind, conditioned reflexes. Uh, he is known for uh, a large school uh, uh, developed in uh, Soviet Union on the physiology, physiology of high nervous activity, which was, as he uh, was uh, describing this, how the matter of the brain produces mind. Vladimir Bechtel, who was uh, initially trained and worked as a neuroanatomist, uh, actually a famous neuroanatomist, and a, a number of brain uh, structures in the human brain are named after him because he discovered and described them, uh, also turned to uh, cognitive science and psychology uh, in a number of his uh, papers and uh, in his uh, monographs on objective psychology. Probably few people in the audience uh, know that uh, Bechterov claimed that he was the first to discover conditioned reflexes, which he indeed did uh, in experiments in humans before power. Uh, one of the features of the current neuroscience and cognitive neuroscience research, as well as other uh, disciplines in, in Russia, it, it is concentrated in large cities like Moscow, St. Petersburg, uh, Kazan, Nizhny Novgorod. So here uh, I listed some of the institutes belonging mainly to the academies of sciences. This is another uh, peculiarity of organization of science in Russia. It is uh, more in the uh, several academies of sciences than uh, in universities. Main funding uh, at the present for the cognitive neuroscience research comes from these academies. Uh, there is now a large program for development of uh, research in uh, state universities, so government assigns a lot of money for the major universities in the country. And there are several foundations uh, which support uh, the basic research with grants, like Russian Foundation for Basic Research. I listed here the topics uh, of one of the, uh, of the Russian Foundation for Basic Research programs, which was called uh, Oriented Cognitive Research. So you can see what uh, were the calls and topics which were funded. Uh, physical and chemical methods to study <coughs> processes, nuclear magnetic resonance, optical and molecular tools for neuroimaging, neuromorphic modeling of intelligence and consciousness, a topic which is uh, calling on the um, uh, uh, agenda of the current meeting, neurophysiological and behavioral studies of cognitive processes, learning and memory, uh, neurolinguistic mechanisms and uh, neurophysiological me mechanisms of social interaction, mirror systems, genetic and epigenetic factors in cognitive development, uh, stress, uh, aging and stimulation of cognitive functions, adult neurogenesis, uh, chemical regulation of cognitive functions, cognitive enhancers, brain computer interfaces. I will now uh, switch to a particular feature of organization of science in Russia, 
which is neuroscience, uh, well, scientific schools generally, in physics, chemistry, uh, biology. Uh, one can discuss the weaknesses and advantages of uh, such organization, but for cognitive research, it is definitely uh, a feature which allows to concentrate on a deep uh, question, on deep problem, uh, over a number of generations, accumulating the research experience belonging to particular way of solving this. I am belonging to the school which is called uh, Functional Systems Theory, and the Functional Systems Theory uh, was developed by E.K. Enoki uh, in the 1930s, uh, specifically to address the issue of the material basis of consciousness and mind. He was a student of Pavlov and Bechterev, and uh, he combined the Pavlovian traditions with neuroanatomy and uh, neurobiological research from the uh, Western biology. He is often described as a psychologist, as you can see in the current citation from the Oxford Companion to the Mind. In fact, he was a physiologist. And the main background for functional system theory came from the experimental research from four directions. He expanded uh, traditional Pavlovian research on the physiology of uh, conditioning by releasing the animals and studying the secretion uh, and physiological parameters of these animals in conditioned reflexes in freely behaving animals. He studied plasticity of the nervous system and uh, interaction of the brain and periphery by using different heterogeneous uh, neural anastomoses, by cutting the nerve and uh, connecting them in unusual combinations, uh, studying the regeneration and compensation of the final functions. He also worked with the impre-physiology of behavior in different species, in amphibia, birds, mammals, studying the development of the integration of physiological systems uh, that underlie behavior. And finally, compensation of impaired functions also after different transplantations. What came from this is uh, the idea or theory of functional systems, which are defined as a combination of uh, different elements cooperating towards achievement of adaptive result for the whole organism. <coughs> And the adaptive result was a main uh, feature of uh, functional system, which leads it to uh, biology, natural selection and evolution, and organizes the activity of the elements in the physiological integration. As you can see, uh, the functional systems are distributed systems with uh, involvement of different anatomical elements into the resulting integration. Yeah which brought the questions of the uh, system genesis, how such functional systems as units of adaptation and integration developed in evolution, how they developed during individual uh, development, uh, anticipating the ecology of the particular species, and how these functional systems are developed anew or uh, modified during individual adaptive learning. In this respect, functional systems theory integrating different aspects of brain evolution and development uh, and bringing psychology into it is very resembling uh, theory of neural group selections and topobiology of Gerald Edelman. One of the critical uh, concepts in the functional systems theory which I cannot go uh, much into details because there are several thousand papers uh, and several dozen monographs uh, on the functional systems theory in psychology, physiology, biology, etc. is uh, nevertheless an uh, important concept of the operational architectonics of functional systems theory, of functional systems. It is important because it describes and gives a bridge between the organization of physiological processes which 
is more than just physiology of activity of cer certain elements and brings uh, cognitive and psychological processes as an aspect of this integration. The important thing which I would like to pay attention here is the stage of the afferent synthesis, which combines the uh, dominating motivation, which means that there is a competition between different functional systems, and one of them reaches the uh, afferent synthesis uh, with the uh, situational afferentation, so it is a contextual uh, situation from the environment with the stimulus, uh, which can be a conditioned stimulus, for example, for triggering a particular behavior, retrieval from memory, and through reverberation process, uh, integration of these elements for the decision making, which in parallel produces the anticipatory model of the required results and the program of action for the performance of this result. So that performance of the result results uh, leads to parameters of results which are by reverse efferentation term uh, which was introduced in 1935 before the feedback uh, uh, is compared with the anticipatory model which was called acceptor of uh, results uh, by acceptor meaning that this is a structure which receives and which is the structure which confirms the acceptance What is important here is the behavior uh, after the efferent synthesis, which synthesizes uh, the integration, uh, is determined by the anticipatory model, which means that there is no and no more stimulus response uh, linear relation. Uh, the model is uh, used with the previous experience and memory which is retrieved uh, from the storage and based on this experience the activity of the nervous system is goal directed and anticipatory. You can see this uh, for example in the one of our experimental um, slides where the activity of the neuron in the cortex of the rabbit is recorded when the animal is performing uh, operant behavior. In order to obtain the food from the feeder, the animal uh, in different uh, trials has either to pull the ring uh, to move the feeder or to press the pedal. It is the same mean to uh, obtain the food but uh, trained differently or again to pull the ring. And it uh, is trained to do it on the left side of the chamber where there is a pair of uh, operant uh, lever and uh, ring uh, and feeder and on the right side. As you can see here, there are two important properties. First, that the neuron uh, which we see here is specialized uh, to the particular uh, system of behavior which is related to pulling the ring. Uh, pulling the ring on the right side does not produce any activation. Second, doing uh, the same consumatory behavior of acquiring the food from the feeder by pressing the pedal does not activate this neuron. So, from this you can see that uh, neurons of this type which are specialized uh, towards particular action are first representing a large system of distributed neurons because we find this uh, type of specialization after learning in neurons of different uh, areas of the cerebral cortex uh, motor cortex, uh, cingulate cortex, visual cortex, uh, subcortical structures like hippocampus or amygdala. Second, that this activity is anticipatory and it is terminated by achieving the result of this action. So this is not an activity in response to particular stimulus, but it is a part of the goal organized activity. And third, that 
knowing and seeing these neurons, which is a population, distributed population, we can see and know that a particular cognitive event is occurring in the animal behavior, which is retrieved from the previous subjective memory. Since a ring is an object which is identified by, uh, discovered by the animal in this case during uh, learning and individual experience. How can we study these events at the systems level? Uh, some years ago we were looking for the genes for uh, consolidation of the long-term memory and uh, discovered that a number of so-called proto-oncogenes, which were known in the middle of 80s at the time of this research as proto-oncogenes, are rapidly induced in the brain of the adult animals, comparable to control animals, during situations of learning and memory acquisition. Further studies of these uh, genes and their activity show that this uh, activation is induced by novelty and learning, so it is uh, due to subjective new experience. It is actually not uh, by stimulus, because, for example, the absence of a particular expected stimulus will produce the similar type of activation. It occurs in neurons, and only in those neurons distributed over various brain areas and circuits, which are involved in acquisition of this experience. It is very rapid, so it can be used as a marker for the populations of cells which are formed as a new functional system during its initial acquisition. So, by uh, combining these molecular biology tools for mapping of the cellular activity during acquisition of new experience, with the tools which we developed to make uh, brain of the animals optically transparent, uh, by replacing the water for the substances which have the same parameters of uh, transmission as the uh, cellular membranes and proteins, so that we can use uh, these uh, substances to clear, uh, this is the brain of the adult mouse, and here you can see the brain of this mouse after optical clearing. It becomes 97% transparent, like a glass. Yeah? And by combining this with the techniques of the uh, single plane elimination microscopy, which allows three dimensional reconstruction, we can see the populations of cells active during uh, acquisition of new experience at the scale of the whole brain with a cellular resolution. Here, for example, it is too light, but you can uh, probably see uh, neurons of the mouse hippocampus, which were active during a single trial of acquisition of fear conditioning uh, uh, memory in contextual conditioning learning. One of the things which comes from uh, these studies is that a single episode of experiences <coughs> induces activation of uh, literally millions of cells. We know that uh, preventing this activity will disturb long-term memory by uh, using, for example, uh, transgenic uh, manipulations or antisense technologies to inhibit expression of these genes in the brain. But the question is how such large populations of cells which store individual memories can be disturbed and destroyed during uh, aging or neurodegenerative disease. Is it possible that all of these cells are damaged uh, for this particular functional system? Or is it rather the disturbance of particular connections with the other elements of the system remaining and maybe capable for recovery? We showed indeed that memories impaired by different treatments 
can be recovered gradually, both in avian brain and in the mammalian brain. So the question was, if impaired memories can be recovered, then how and where the latent memories are stored? We used these mapping tools that I described before to look for uh, this with a hypothesis that probably with the amnestic animal brain, uh, where the animal at the behavior, because of the impairment of memory, shows amnesia, we still have the responses of the brain, which will be different from the naive brain. That means that there are certain traces of memory which are left. And just uh, shortly, looking into the brain of such amnestic animals, we can see uh, this is the behavior of the animals, and uh, you should compare uh, the control animals which received uh, saline with the animals uh, which were amnestic and those with the recovered memories. You can see that the expression uh, of these genes like CFOS in the amygdala, which is responsible for the integration of the freezing behavior, is impaired in amnestic animals. However, if we will look in the same brain into hippocampus in say one region, we can see that though animal has no indexes of the behavioral response to the uh, contextual situation, is not freezing, uh, the expression of C4 in the brain of these uh, in the C1 area of these amnestic animals is exactly the same as in the control trained animals. So there is a dissociation of the response to the conditioned stimulus uh, in the brains of uh, amnestic animals and certain structures maintain the response relevant to the uh, particular experience. Excuse me? Yeah? What was the basis for the amnesia? Sorry? What was the basis for the amnesia? Was it? It was produced by protein synthesis inhibitor cyclic exomide. Uh, targeted damage. To, to yeah. No, it was systemic injection of the protein synthesis inhibitor. It was not injected into a particular brain region. And coming back to the uh, topic of my uh, talk, which I introduced initially, going back to uh, the cognitive psychology or psychology of memory uh, of here even 19th century demonstrates that the phenomena of memory recovery, which we came to after a number of stages in neurobiological uh, testing and hypothesis, has been actually known quite long. Sergei Korsakov, a famous Russian psychiatrist, after him uh, the Korsakov syndrome is named, but his idea was uh, to study memory a uh, neural basis of memory, and he did it after different uh, uh, intoxications, uh, wrote that the most interesting feature of the syndrome that he describes, that sometimes uh, the memory, which seemed to be completely gone and impaired, uh, suddenly recovers and comes back. So there is a lot that we can learn for the uh, neurobiology of cognitive processes like memory and modeling of these processes from the cognitive psychology and cognitive neuroscience. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for a short question. On the last topic, what was the explanation for why such memories would reemerge a year later? Was there a particular explanation? <coughs> Just a moment, I will show you. Mm -hmm.
What we use for memory recovery, there are two, two forms of memory recovery. One is spontaneous recovery of memory, and second, we can induce recovery by reminder, presenting of the elements of the acquisition situation without association, just one of the stimuli, which brings impaired memory back. Uh, we found that uh, this recovery has two features. First, it is a, a slow process. Both in mammals and birds, it takes about several hours, from five to seven hours. Second, this process is NMDA activity dependent and protein synthesis dependent, which uh, suggests to us <coughs> that what happens after uh, stimulus uh, rec uh, for recovery is presented, after reminder is presented, that the part of the circuitry which is intact and is active after the presentation of the stimulus starts to rebuild the rest of the functional system circuitry which was impaired with the synaptic modifications and protein synthesis and slowly in the background of the other activity of the animal uh, the functional systems come back after several hours so if you test these animals uh, at three or five hours, they are still amnestic, but starting from seven hours, uh, they show the normal memory. Uh, Very short. Sure, sure. sure. Uh, you showed those beautiful pictures of the uh, cells in the hippocampus and the uh, growth brain that were responsive. Their immediate early genes were <coughs> upregulated uh, after the training. Can you, did you have any chance to look at? The connectivity of those cells? Um, can you say anything about how those cells are interconnected? No, because this is a very large population, so you need uh, to combine uh, this functional mapping with the uh, tools for connectivity, like, for example, which we are planning to do, uh, to use a rainbow mice, which have uh, differently colored uh, cells by deep combination of different fluorescent proteins, so you can trace uh, their axons and their dendrites overlaying on the functional map of the activity which we do have. This is more difficult than we can achieve now because what we do with the optical mapping at the moment is only using one uh, wavelength of 44, uh, 40, uh, 4, 488 nanometers for the uh, green fluorescent protein. We need a multicolor imaging system.